So the author's background, remember, if it is Paul, then the most logical, the most sensible time period is when he's in Arabia and he's writing to Hebrews, being a Hebrew of the Hebrews himself, he knows how to minister to them. So he's writing to his own people about tribulation doctrine. Now remember, that was the primary doctrine to Jews of that time. In the transitional time period of Acts, that's what Jewish apostles were talking about. The Christian doctrine was not introduced yet. The body of Christ about Gentiles being in there was not introduced yet until the Apostle Paul was learning it in Arabia. So while he's writing this, he's being introduced to Christian doctrine. So that's the kind of background we see in Hebrews. So there's a mingling, right? There's a mingling. If there is this mingling, then what is the author writing about? What is he having in his mind when he's writing? It's important to keep in mind that before we examine it, that it is a matter of fact that we take verses and make sure that sometimes half of a verse could apply to one time period, the other half could apply to another time period, right? Now, that is crucial, and that is, matter of fact, biblical truth in hermeneutics. Sometimes there could be double application, triple application in one verse, or within the three verses there could be this way, right? You see that? Mm -hmm. So it can work and operate in this manner. It's important to keep that in mind. Now, taking that for granted, that's how we're going to divide the verses, then what are they divided in application-wise? Application-wise is historical and then the doctrinal prophetic part. Why is it divided in this manner is because when you think about the author behind Hebrews, the author behind the book of Hebrews, we know that obviously man is the writer of it. So then we have to think about what his perspective is when he's writing. And he's likely writing many things that relates to his timeline. But at the same time, remember, God is the ultimate author. Hence, it's not going to be historical about man's time period, man's perspective. In God's perspective, when the man is writing, God could be seeing a different point of view. He could see a doctrinal application or a prophetic application behind it. And the only people and the only way you can see that is if you look at the entire Bible itself. When you look at the entire Bible and when you look at the verse, then you know that that verse, what God intended to have in mind on which doctrinal or prophetic interpretation it was. Now that's inevitable and that is indisputable in biblical hermeneutics that you don't even have to be a dispensationalist to agree on that, okay? I mean, even Calvinists, non-denoms, no matter what denomination you are, they all use Old Testament verses that talk about the Messiah. When, when you look at the historical application or the intention behind it, the author likely didn't have that in mind in writing about the Messiah. They were either talking about themsel uh, themselves or the nation or something else. Who knows? Maybe... They did see what God saw about a prophetic application to the Messiah, but when you read a lot of the verses, a lot of them don't. So remember that. So that's inevitable. Now, this is a foolproof biblical hermeneutic interpretation tool and method that pretty much everyone can agree with, but they refuse to believe this dispensational approach because they're just stubborn. Now, understanding that, then let's think what's in the mind of the author when he's writing these verses. Either remember one, he is, like I told you before, writing in the time period of the book of Acts, and because of that, God is still dealing with the Jewish people, and they're anticipating the rapture and the tribulation to happen. Because of that, Paul is writing tribulation stuff to Jews. But the second thing is, even though the writer is thinking that the verse he's writing about his tribulation. That's only the historical part. The doctrinal prophetic part, from what God sees, could be to the Christians instead. The third is the writer, he thinks that the verses that he's writing are tribulation doctrines to Jews, but God 
applies those verses to Christians as well. So in other words, God sees it as, okay, this can work for tribulation, but this can also work for Christians. Okay? So we understand that. Now, there's probably more points than one, two, and three. I'm pretty sure of that. But this is the best that I could come up with, with what the writer was thinking when he was writing the book of Hebrews. A lot of people don't understand double application in Scripture. They said, no, no, it should be only one application, historical, what the writer is thinking about during his time period, what his perspective was to the audience he's writing to. No, that's not true. As I've taught you before, God, he could be seeing those verses that the writer is writing about historically as, no, I see it as something that could happen in the future, where in the future something else could happen. And it could be my son, Jesus the Messiah. You're talking about his death. You're talking about his burial, his resurrection. It's talking about the church, my Christian church, where the Gentiles would come in and they would partake in these blessings, these doctrines. So whatever it is, God sees a doctrinal, prophetic application behind the verse. Okay, now that we've understood this, that this is the, uh, that, the verses in Hebrews could be one of these three, then let's start doing that at Hebrews chapter 2. Let the games begin. This is going to be a lot of fun. Okay, now, Hebrews chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 11. Now, I explained that one before, but in verse 11, if he's writing, if Paul is writing about church age doctrine. Now remember, he doesn't know that it's church age doctrine, right? It's very likely he uh, didn't know that. This, he's writing to tribulation Jews. Remember that? That's his background. But then God was seeing it as church age doctrine. So then Paul, if he's writing to tribulation Jews, he could be talking about in the sense that in verse 11, that Jesus Christ after he died on the cross, he sanctified everyone. And because of that, everyone can join in unity and he can call them his family. So it is very true that Jews in the tribulation, when they're undergoing that, they're going to have to rely their salvation on what Jesus did on the cross. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, they all become his family. They all become his family, one unity. Now, in God's mind, however, if this is church age doctrine right here, what God is seeing is that when Jesus died on the cross, he's seeing where not just the Hebrews themselves, but eventually anyone around the world, which could be the Gentiles, that they unite together as one body. So as the body of Jesus Christ. And if, I were, if you were to look at verse 11, and this is going to be very powerful against hyper-dispensationalists, I want you to keep in mind. But when you look at verse 11, the first thing in our mind, would you honestly think tribulation Jew or would you think church age doctrine? Now, for a person who's reading that, they would obviously think church age doctrine, wouldn't they? Body of Christ would come into mind. That after Jesus Christ died, he made sure that everyone would unite together as one and Jesus would consider them to be his family. So we see the body of Christ mentioned at verse 11. Now, verse 12, all right, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So remember, Jesus is speaking here. That's what the author of Hebrews is claiming. And he's saying that Jesus said, I will make sure to mention your name, proclaim your name to my family, my saved family. In the middle of the church, I'm going to sing praise to you. So here is Jesus Christ singing praise to the Father, rejoicing over his family that God has given to him thanks to the death of the cross when he died on the cross. Now, uh, the cross reference is Psalm 22, 22. Psalm 22, 22. Notice that the psalmist writes that what we would think would be the psalmist himself declaring God's name unto his family. But we see right here that even though the author 
the psalmist historically thinks that, God, the ultimate author, knows that, no, this is prophetic, where it is referring to, in the book of Hebrews right here, Jesus Christ is giving this statement. So you see that right there? Man, historical interpretation, God, doctrinal, prophetic interpretation. So this is evidence right here that when the, uh, the author of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 22, 22, you can't just think historical. You have to put doctrinal prophetic. Otherwise, the author of Hebrews is lying. So remember, the Calvinist or a non-dispensationalist, they have to agree with what I'm giving to you right here. This is foolproof. There's no other way around this. So Psalm 22, 22, historically, the psalmist can be talking about himself, but prophetically, we see right here that this is Jesus, the Messiah. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Now, if we go back to Hebrews 2, 12, how are you all so far? Uh, you all got lost or are we yeah, following so far? Good. All right, all right. So in, uh, let me continue on. We co covered verse 11, now verse 12, okay? So one by one. So if the writer of Hebrews is historically writing to Jews about tribulation doctrine, then what he's talking about right here is that Jesus Christ will proclaim the Father's name to his family and in the middle of, notice right here, church, he's going to sing praise to him. Now, when you look at that, church does not necessarily have to be only the Christian church in the church age. Church is simply means called out assembly. You want to keep that in mind. Church means called out assembly. Uh, if you look at Revelation 2 and 3, this is tribulation doctrine, but notice that he's writing to churches, right? So it's simply meaning a called out assembly. It doesn't necessarily have to mean the body of Christ in the church age, what we deem to be the Christian church. All right, we follow so far? Amen. So he's just talking about called out assembly. There's too many passages on that one, actually. In fact, Israel or Jews are known as the church. Didn't you know that? Jews are also known as the church. I'll give you one passage. Go to Acts 7. Okay. Go to the book of Acts. And then we'll look at chapter 7. Notice that when Moses led the children of Israel out in the wilderness, they were known as the church. So if the author of Hebrews is writing to Hebrews, when he calls them church, he means it in the sense how Moses led the church in, through the wilderness, meaning a called out assembly. So look at Acts chapter 7. Notice right here in verse, thank you, 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. All right, so the evidence is Acts 7. You can also use Revelation 2 through 3, where God was speaking to churches about tribulation doctrine, and Revelation is about tribulation doctrine. All right, so that's what the writer of Hebrews could be referring to at Hebrews 2.12. Now, in our minds, we would think church, obviously, right? When we read that passage, Hebrews 2.12. So that's the first thing in our mind. And that's where I lean more heavily upon. So if the writer was simply thinking in the sense that I'm writing tribulation doctrine to Hebrews, God, on the other hand, could be seeing it as, no, this is talking about my brethren, my family, that Jesus Christ will declare uh, the Father's name in the middle of that Christian church. And that's why Jesus Christ can rejoice, praise God about that. That's the idea in Hebrews 2.12. Now, uh, that would be the easier interpretation when we look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. So here are Pauline verses. So remember, Pauline epistles, he was writing to the Christian church, right? So let's look at Pauline epistles that match up with these verses right here. Now, uh, let's look at the Pauline verses that match with Hebrew 2.12, okay? So the first one is, uh, let's see right here. It is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, if we're thinking about right here in Hebrews 2.12, 
that Jesus Christ is saying that uh, I will declare uh, God's name to my family in the middle of this called out assembly, I'm going to sing praise to you. If we're thinking that this is uh, a Jewish or tribulation application, there's one concern about that, all right? So it ain't proof against Jewish tribulation doctrine, but it is a concern. This is why I'm saying that I lean more to church age doctrine for Hebrews 2.12, okay? The concern is, notice it says the church, right? So when he's saying the church right here, it doesn't sound like a called a local called out assembly. Yeah, come on. Usually when you talk about called out assemblies in the Bible, if that's what you mean by church called out assemblies, we see that in a local sense, local sense, a designated area. But Christians, we are called uh, as the body of Christ in a universal sense. Now, some of you don't know that. Church has two meanings. It's a, uh, we're called the local church, but also we're known as the universal church. So believe it or not, we're, we should be more Catholic than the Catholics. Catholic church means yeah. universal Catholic, church. Yeah. But the problem with the universal church, Catholic church, their head is the Pope, see? Yeah. Our head is Christ. Amen. The difference with us and the Catholics is we have a universal church, but the head is Jesus Christ. Amen. The only reason why we do a local church, too, is because we don't trust any man as a head of the universally speaking, all right? So now, local church is mostly referred to the sense when the Bible says church has a called out assembly. So if, you, if we say right here that these Jews are known simply as a called out assembly church, the problem is when we use that term called out assembly, majority of the times in your Bible, it's referring to a local area, local designated area. The only time we see universal church is actually for the Pauline epistles, Christians. That's the thing. It, did, it doesn't matter which areas Christians are scattered around. They're all considered universally as the church. Yeah. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So this sounds like a universal church. That's the problem. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter, oh, excuse me, 10. I was right, 10, 10. And then verse 32, verse 32. Notice the Bible says, give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the what? Church of God. Church of God. So notice right here, Jews are separated from what? The church of God. See, God does not consider the Christian church to be the Jewish people. So when we return back to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, it's likely from what I see that uh, number two is operating here, that the right that the writer is uh, writing as if this was tribulation doctrine to the Jewish people, but God sees it as, no, that's referring to the universal church. That's referring to the body of Christ. That's referring to Christians all around the world. Because it sounds like in verse 12, when Jesus is praising the Lord about his family, it's a universal church. It's a, sing it's a singular universal church. It doesn't sound local here. All right, verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Okay, so the author is quoting two verses here. Uh, the author is saying that in one passage, that it sounds like Jesus is putting his trust in God. The other one is another scripture. And again, lo and behold, that's what behold means, right? So... I, Jesus Christ, and the children that God gave to me. That's self-explanatory. All right, so let's look at these two verses here. The two verses we're going to look at is going to be the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 8. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 8. And the other one to be uh, Isaiah 12 and Psalm 18. So three passages, three passages. Isaiah 8, Isaiah 12, and then Psalm 18. Everybody's head intact so far? Yeah. All right, we're all following along so far? All right. If any of you have questions or got lost, then just ask me after class, all right? I'll show it to you one by one, then I'll click. All right, Psalm 18, Isaiah 8, and Isaiah 12. 
All right, uh, let's look at these things uh, one by one. Let's first look at Isaiah chapter, uh, let's look at, first of all, Isaiah 12, 2. Isaiah 12, 2. Notice right here. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. See that? So that's what Hebrews 13a, I will put my trust in him. That's a scripture passage that the author of Hebrews was probably referring to. If not this one, then it would be Psalm 18. All right? Go to Psalm 18. And then the verse will be verse 2. Verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. See that? So this could be referring uh, to that. Uh, the second part, which is Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17 through 18. Isaiah 8, verse 17 through 18. That's the next part that uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 13 could be quoting about, Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. All right? Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. That part would be in this passage, Isaiah chapter 8, and then verse 17 through 18. The Bible says, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look at him. I will look for him, excuse me. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel, from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now, this might sound like an individual Jew in the historical interpretation, but the author of Hebrew points out that this is referring more th so through Jesus Christ. That is the real individual from the Jewish line at Isaiah 8, 17 through 18. So again, historical, doctrinal, prophetic interpretation, right? With the Old Testament verses. But we have to do that with Hebrews as well. So in Hebrews... Uh, here's the part then, when we go to chapter 2 and verse 13, the first part, right, of the scripture. Again, I will put my trust in him. So then, like I mentioned to you before, it sounds like the author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus Christ puts his trust in God the Father. But there is, um, uh, there is one thing that's questionable to me about that one. Because when I look at those Old Testament verses, the author of Hebrews is quoting uh, Psalm 18 and the others. This sounds more like a, a saved person or an individual who puts his trust in God. That's how I see it more as an individual who puts his trust in God for salvation, uh, physically or spiritually salvation, doesn't matter. But the point is it seems more accurate to me rather than Jesus. This is talking about the saved child of God himself. Now, what is the evidence for that? The evidence is because of verse 11 through 12. We're assuming that 11 and 12 is all about Jesus Christ. No, it's about Jesus Christ and his saved family. Right? Is that what you notice right there in 11 and 12? The context is not just Jesus. It's Jesus and his saved family. So how do we not know then at verse 13, I will put my trust in him. The author is referring to his family who puts their trust in God, right? So that's the reason why it's possible that this is referring to God's family who puts their trust in God himself. Amen. Now, could it be Jesus Christ? It could be. It could be Jesus Christ who puts his trust in God the Father. But from what I see at uh, the book of Psalm and the other verses, it seems more accurate it's referring to God's family. God's family. But anyway, that is just uh, my theory. That's not doctrine. It's important that when we study verse by verse, that you don't claim everything as doctrine. Now let me repeat that again. It's important when you explain everything verse by verse, you don't claim it as doctrine. What do I mean by that? That means you're not Mr. Know-it-all, and then you know the 100% right interpretation for every verse. So, you know, though, uh, those uh, skeptics, they, do, uh, they are right. Uh, you can't claim that you know it all, but neither should you be like those skeptics or those other extreme that you can't know anything at all. See? So uh, you have to have a balance. You have to have a balance. So things that the Lord shows you from his word that's very clear, that's indisputable, you claim that as doctrine, 
But when you see the, that there are alternate explanations or questionable things in the verses, you're supposed to leave it simply as a theory. That's very important to understand, okay? Now, uh, when we continue on right here, then in verse 13, I will put my trust in him. Let's pretend, uh, no, uh, you know what I mean by pretend, okay? So let's pretend that the writer here, he is writing historically uh, to tribulation Jews. And if it has application to the tribulation, then it would mean that the tribulation saints, they have to put their trust in Jesus Christ. Now, remember the whole context here of verse 11, 12, and 13 is Jesus Christ because he died on the cross. He was able to bring in salvation and then people are able to become his saved family. All right? So tribulation saints have to do that Obviously. Now go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Obviously, if you're a person who's going through a tribulation, you're not going to say, I'm not going to put my trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, right? You have to. You have to believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected, and that he can save your soul. So you have to do that. But what we see the, the, the additional part in the tribulation in Revelation 12, 11, is when they put their trust in Christ, his shed blood for salvation, they have to take account their works as well. Yeah, Remember in the entire book of Hebrews, the entire book of Hebrews is tribulation doctrine yes. for Jews. That's, That's why it talks about works for salvation or losing salvation. Amen. So notice Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 and they overcame him. This is a tribulation, right? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. See that? So because they have to put their faith in the shed blood of Christ. But notice, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. That's their salvation here. They have to make sure that they even die for him. That's a lot of work. Why? Because uh, you have to resist the mark of the beast. So just having faith in Christ is not enough in tribulation if you have 666 on your right hand, right? So you have to die in the tribulation. Uh, here's another one. Go to Revelation chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 12, verse 12. Notice that the tribulation saints put their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ, but they have to keep the works as well. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and what? The faith, of Jesus. faith of Jesus. See, that's very important. Okay, go back now. Go back. Go back. So if the author of he the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 2:13 is writing to Jews in the tribulation, he's discussing about Jews in the tribulation, they have to obviously put their faith in Jesus the Messiah. Because remember, Jews have a trouble looking at Jesus as Messiah, right? So Jews have to put their trust in Jesus as their Messiah for their salvation during the tribulation. That's pretty obvious. They have to do that. But remember the catch, the additional factor is they have to do works, which we're going to see later on. You're going, uh, we saw that before at Hebrews 2, and we're going to see that later on at Hebrews 3. There's no doubt there's works in addition to this. But here's the thing. In Hebrews 2.13, the writer may have thought of that, but it's also possible that God instead sees, no, this is actually a doctrinal prophetic application. So again, number two, the doctrinal prophetic application is when my son Jesus died on the cross that the Christian saints put their trust in Jesus Christ for salvation without any works involved. If you look at verse 13, there's no works there, right? See that? No works mentioned right here. So because of that, in this passage, this verse, it would apply very well to the Christian church. So uh, the Pauline epistle that was supported is Galatians, uh, <coughs> is Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 13. Or Ephesians 1, 12 is better. Ephesians 1, 12. How are we doing so far? We all follow along so far? Amen. All right, then. I'm doing very step-by-step step so no one gets lost, okay? 
Ephesians 1.12. Notice this is Pauline language. That we should be to the praise of his glory who what? First trusted in Christ. Now look at that. The praise of his glory. Trusted in Christ. Hebrews 2.12. I will sing praise to thee. Verse 13. I will put my trust in him. See that? This is pretty Pauline here. You see that? Did we follow along so far or are you lost? All right then. Here's another one. Paul said, the next part, that I am the children which God hath given me. Okay, so let's go to the tribulation aspect first. But then I'm going to show you the church age, which combines this. So I really believe this is church age application here, not really tribulation. So the next part of verse 13, the writer, he's talking about that Jesus the Messiah, he has uh, these people who become his children due to his death on the cross. If the writer is writing to Jews in the tribulation, obviously they become God's children. Why? Because remember, we looked at Revelation 14 and 12. They put their faith uh, in the shed blood of Christ. They're actually known as children, I believe, at Revelation 22. Look at what God says. So I'm going by memory here. Let's go to Revelation uh, chapter... 22, hopefully I can uh, find this quickly. Revelation chapter 22, no, then it's 21, it's 21. Revelation chapter 21. Look at this, the ones who uh, become his children in verse 7. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. He that overcometh, so obviously those in the tribulation overcame a lot, right? Tribulation, they overcame a lot of tribulation. <laughs> so, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So notice right here, God recognizes his children during the timeline of the tribulation. If you also look at verse chapter 22, verse 9, Chapter 22, verse 9, notice that God recognizes his family, the brethren here. Uh, Revelation 22, 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren. See that? Thy brethren. Okay, um, let's go back. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. Now, if that's what the writer was thinking about, as he penned those words to tribulation Jews, God would doctrinally, prophetically see this as, no, this is actually referring to uh, my Christian children. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, Jesus is stating here, this is the family you've given to me. And the evidence is Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Notice right here that Paul stated, Pauline again, Pauline language. You become the children of God by faith, by faith. And Hebrews 2.13 said, when you trust in him, you become his children. See that? And there's no works mentioned in this verse. No works mentioned in this verse. So in this particular verse, it's more strong to church age Christians. Church age Christians. Uh, let's look at Hebrew, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by what? Faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, there's a lot right here that screams Pauline. You see that, right? Mm -hmm. It screams very Pauline here. Uh, remember that, all right? Remember that. The strong Pauline implication. That's indisputable so far, right? And I'm going to point out to you later, so remember that. Okay, verse 14. I am not going to finish this. Let me hurry. All right. Verse 14. For as mu uh, Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, uh, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Okay, follow along here. Let me explain every word in the verse first, all right? So the writer is saying, 
for as much since all of God's uh, children here are, they are of flesh and blood. They partake in that. They're involved in that. So they're all humans, he's basically saying. God's children are humans. God himself had to become human. So uh, Jesus Christ had to become human, similar with them, be like them, the same with them. So then he had to die a human death so that he can be like the human. See that? Amen. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So taking the same likeness of humans where he dies a human death as well, then he can be able to successfully destroy Satan's Amen. grip, his power. Yeah. What's his power? Death. Satan's power is over death. And then at verse 15, Jesus Christ is able to deliver those who are afraid of death. Throughout all their lives, they were always uh, subject to bondage. So they were enslaved to a fear of death. Before Jesus Christ died on the cross, uh, Old Testament saints, they're not like, see, right here, New Testament Christians. Old Testament saints, they always lived in fear of dying. They lived in fear of dying. But then Christians, we're not afraid to die because we know whom we believed. We know what we're going after we die. So uh, notice right here that the Old Testament saints then, then their salvation is different. Yeah, come on. So their salvation is different during the Old Testament time because they didn't have the death of Christ yet. Mm -hmm. The death of Christ, what it established is that because he took on death for them, we don't have to have any fear of death later on because we know that he controls, he took over the power of death, took it away from Satan. That's the idea. Now, uh, this, there's a lot to unpack here, so let me do one at a time. So first of all, uh, <coughs> let's look at, uh, how can we do this one by one? First of all, let's look at what he means right here, Jesus Christ destroyed uh, Satan's power over death. So go to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now, a lot of people don't think about this. How did Satan have the power of death? We can all guess, right? How did he get that? He got it through sin. He got it when Adam and Eve partook in the fruit. Now, did you remember what Satan lied to Eve? Eve said, if I take that fruit, I'm going to die. The devil knew that. But he lied. He said, you're not going to die. Why did he lie to them? Because he wants that power. He knows once they partake in that fruit, he'll have the power of death. That's why he lied about death to them. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. All right. Now, going back to the text, Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. All right, I mentioned before at verse 15 that the people in the Old Testament before Jesus died on the cross, they were always afraid to die, correct? So if that's the case, then uh, let's look at uh, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 18. Because their, their salvation that time was not dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse them of their sins. So that's why they had to sacrifice a lot of animals, remember? Right. Before the shed blood of Christ, they had to shed a lot of blood of animals. Can, now, use your head now. Do you really think that they have enough animals to cover every single sin that they've committed or they can keep track of that? Come on. They can't, right? So because of that, that's why they were always afraid, wondering if their good works are enough to outwear their bad. Because if it's not, then uh, they, won't, they wouldn't be saved then. Notice how people died in the Old Testament. You talk about paranoia and checking up uh, your salvation, you know, or your good works. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. And then verse 21, verse 21. But if the wicked, so let's say you lived your whole life wicked. All right, you're definitely going to go to hell then. Will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful. See, works of the law, law, law. Right? Jesus Christ's death, lawful and right. 
He shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous, so let's say you lived a righteous life, all right? You lived a wicked life, but at the end, if you forsook your wickedness and lived right, then God considered you as the one who had life. But let's say you're the righteous person, and it just so happened, your unbroken record, at the end, you messed up something wicked. All right, you know what God said at verse 24? Verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? <coughs> all his righteousness that he hath done shall not be what? Wow. Mentioned. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's why they were afraid to die. No wonder, you know. Wow. Think about Solomon, for example. A lot of people wonder if he's saved or lost. Because Solomon, at the end of his life, he mentioned, fear God, keep his commandments. That's the last statement he gave before he died. See, there's that paranoia in death, because they know that they messed up in their life. And in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. See, he will die in his sin. He will die in his sin. In verse 20, it said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. See, this is a death of a soul we're talking about here. This is not just uh, referring to some kind of uh, physical destruction. This is so much more than that. This is the salvation of their soul dependent on that during the Old Testament time. Okay, now, then here's the interesting part. You ready? Are we all following so far? Yep. All right. So far, we understand from verse 14 and 15, the author's point is that before Jesus died on the cross, people were afraid to die. But because now Jesus died on the cross, the children of God won't have to fear death because His blood can give a clean slate. Amen. With His blood giving a clean slate, Amen. then they don't have to worry about keeping track of their lives, right? Yeah. That's why Catholics are one of the most paranoid people in the world. And if they only go to confession once in their lifetime, they shouldn't be afraid to die. They don't keep track of all that. Now, here's the thing right here, all right? So then, if the writer, y'all fall, listen, okay, keep track with me, all right? You're going to get lost, all right? So think about it. If the writer is writing to Jews in the tribulation, remember they're living faith, yes, in the shed blood of Christ, but also what? Works. So wouldn't, listen, wouldn't then there be fear, should still there be fear of death like the Old Testament saints? See that? So then we're wondering about that. So here's the answer to that. The answer is if the writer is thinking about tribulation doctrine as he is writing this to the Jews and God says that it does apply to the tribulation, it still makes sense when you think about 1 John 1. Go to 1 John 1. What's the key difference here? Okay, so uh, let me write this on the board so that nobody gets lost and you want to keep this in mind. Otherwise, you're going to... Forget it and mess up. Now remember, in the, in the Bible, the one that's considered to be tribulation epistles that has mainly Jewish application is the books of Hebrews to Jude or Hebrews to Revelation, all right? That's fine. The ones that are Christian is obviously Pauline epistle, Romans to Philemon. We already got that. All right, if this is tribulation epistle, then 1 John would have tribulation application, okay? So, it still won't change the fact. <coughs> In the Old Testament, the key is they did not have the shed blood of Christ, right? But the tribulation saint, they have that. So all they have to do is just simply confess it, and Jesus' blood can wash it. See, they don't, have to keep uh, they don't have to keep track of every single animal and then, you know, shed a whole bunch of animals for everything that they do. This can be done momentarily on the spot. So they just have to confess their sin and claim the blood of Jesus Christ on the spot. That's unlike an Old Testament saint who will have to keep track of everything and then schedule that appointment where he can carry on his animal and hope to God that he'll confess everything rightly and all that. So there's a difference here. The difference is what? The death of Christ. 
the shed blood of Christ. So as long as they keep confessing their sin underneath the blood of Christ, they can get that clean slate. Amen. So in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if this is <coughs> doctrine that can apply to the tribulation, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. See that? So they can get that clean slate. If they fail in their work, they can get the clean slate again. So that all unrighteousness. So that confession is very important during the tribulation. So it's still, they're, they have an advantage. They're way off better than uh, the Christian. I mean, excuse me, not the Christian. Christians are way better, so I'll point that out later. But they're way better off than the Old Testament yeah, saints, all right? Good. Yeah. Good. Wow. All right, we all follow or are you lost? Okay. Amen. Looks like we got it so far. Now, remember, the Bible says they overcame him. The uh, you know what? Here's a verse. Go to Revelation 12. This is interesting. Revelation 12. Let's go back to the same passage. Didn't you know... How the, over, uh, how the tribulation saints overcome Satan by the blood is in context because Satan is accusing them of their sins. Let me repeat that again. So Satan is accusing these tribulation saints of their sins, but the saints are able to overcome that because they keep what? Using the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Notice right here, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. <coughs> For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused, uh, excuse me, uh, which accused them before our God day and night. See that? Yeah. He's accusing them of every sin that they're committing. But the tribulation saints in verse 11 are able to overcome him by the blood of the lamb. See that? So that because they keep doing that, they can get cleansing from all all unrighteousness, clean slate. So the best thing to do is before you go to bed at night, you just plead the blood of Jesus Christ and then you can get a clean slate. Start off your day that way. All right, now anyway, let's go back. Let's go back to Hebrews 2. So if he is writing to <coughs> tribulation uh, Jews, that would make sense. But what we see this would more easily apply, see again? Well, we can see that would more easily apply, and let's be honest, it is easier to apply to who? Us Christians, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. That would make way more sense. It would make way more sense that in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, we have no fear of death, and the reason why is because uh, the blood of Jesus Christ and our salvation is uh, dependent on him, so there is no fear of death. So here's a good passage. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans uh, chapter 8. Notice right here that this person is confident. He is confident that he is still in Christ. He is still in Christ. This person is confident. Pauline epistle, Christian. Romans 8, 38. For I am what? persuaded, see that? Persuaded, that neither death nor life. See, he, he's not afraid of death. Anything in life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. How about that? So we would be concerned, well, what about my present, how I'm living now? What about my future? What if I sin in the future? No, Paul said, no, I'm confident that's not going to happen. That's very different from the language of work salvation or keeping track and losing salvation. No, this is, you can tell, once I'm saved, the present and the future is locked and loaded too, no matter what I do. Uh, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So you're not in the wrath of God, you're in His love. And in Christ, you're still locked in Christ. Now, the whole context of Hebrews 2 13 through 14 was about Christ's superiority over death, right? Christ's conquest over death. Wouldn't that be Pauline? Wouldn't that be more found in his Pauline epistles? Yes, in Romans 8, he talks about that, how uh, Christ is victorious over death when we look at, for example, 35, right? When we look at verse 36, right? Here's another one. Uh, Romans 5, the whole chapter. Mark down Romans 5. What is that? 
whole chapter about Jesus Christ became human, partaker of flesh and blood, like Hebrews 2, 13 through 14 talked about. Romans 5, 1 through 10, that matches with Hebrews 2, 13, uh, 2, 13, 14, and was it 15? Yeah, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Christ became partaker of human flesh and took on death so that he can beat death. Yeah, amen. And then Praise Romans 5, 11, all the way downward, shows how in Adam we all die, but Christ took over. He had superiority over death. So this is very Pauline Christian. See that? Amen. This is very Pauline Christian. So what I see right here is number two. So far what I see right here in verse Hebrews 2, 11 through 15, so far what we looked at, that supports point number two right here. The writer thinks it's tribulation doctrine, but God sees it something more so that, no, this is actually Christian. I am open to the possibility of three, but only a possibility. It is possible you could apply that to tribulation, but the verse is showing it, I mean, there are verses that can show it and support it, but the strength and the language is, sounds more Pauline Christian. See that? Mm -hmm. All right, but anyway, remember that. Keep that in mind Good. as we continue on. All right, how are we doing so far? Anyone lost? Mm -hmm. Everyone's okay? All right, some people are lost, then ask me after class, all right? All right. Now, verse 16, all right? Verse 16. For verily he took, <coughs> he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. All right, so the author is saying, for surely Jesus Christ uh, didn't take on himself angelic nature, the heavenly nature. He took on what? Flesh and blood nature. He took on him the seed of Abraham. He took the Jewish line for him. Now, Paul, he quite often mentions about Jesus Christ becoming the, the Jewish seed. So again, Pauline language, and the evidence is Romans chapter 1 and verse 3. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. That way I can continue on. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. See that? All right. Now going back. <coughs> so Pauline Christian, again, I see the language. Obviously, verse 16, you can uh, use it for tribulation too. There's nothing that would contradict it. Jesus Christ taking on the Jewish seed. But anyway, verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. Meaning that that's why in everything it was fitting for him that he would become like what? His family, flesh and blood, right? He's referring to the humans here the humans who got saved and became God's family. So it became fitting for him to become like us humans. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. In other words, Jesus Christ became a human. That way he can understand human nature. Uh, I just ruined it. Okay, let me read verse 18 and then I'll explain it again. Verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Okay, meaning then in totality, let me repeat again, Jesus Christ <coughs> became a human, uh, he became a human so that he can understand what humans go through in their temptations. Yeah. And because of that, he can become that merciful and faithful high priest Amen. that does reconciliation for the sins of his children, his people. Reconciling means uh, where two contradicting parties, see, God's holiness, the sins of the people, they can unite and become one. That's what reconciliation means. That's one of the shuns in your Bible you have to know. Reconciliation. It's to make two contrary parties, uh, opposing parties into one. So Jesus Christ <laughs> put them into unity together. That's why he's merciful and faithful because he understands human nature. He lived through it. See that? So he can be faithful to keep reconciling for us in anything that would pertain to God and then just keep reconciling for the sins of the people. All right, so far we understood every word in verse 17 then, right? Uh, remember, behoved means fitting. Okay, that's what it was. That's what behoved means in verse 17. Now, verse 18, each and every word explaining that part would be that <coughs> that's the reason is because Jesus Christ himself went through the sufferings of temptations. 
which is why he is able to support, help, provide. That's what succor means. Those who go through temptations. Okay, now, let's look at the writer here. If he's writing to Jews in the tribulation here, he's pointing out that because Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he can constantly be the high priest for us and make sure to become the, uh, the mediator between the sins of the Jews who are going through their problems in the tribulation, who are going through sinful struggles during the tribulation. I mean, in the tribulation, you can imagine so much temptation going on, right? Tribulation is another word is akin to temptation. I don't know if you knew that. So because of that, so much temptation going on and tribulation occurring during the tribulation, then they'll need Jesus Christ during the tribulation to constantly be their high priest in the meantime, that he can be understanding and faithful. So if we go to 1 John chapter 2, so go to 1 John 2. <clears throat> So remember, 1 John has tribulation doctrine. So if this part has any application to the tribulation, then it would be as follows. Look at 1 John 2, 1. Notice right here, Jesus Christ being that mediator, right? He's, being, uh, that, uh, he's doing that priestly job, trying to reconcile the sins of the people with the holiness of God. He's trying to mediate for them. 1 John 2, 1, <clears throat> my little children, these things write I unto you, that he sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. See that? Mm -hmm. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See that? So notice right here that by his death, he's able to mediate between the sins of the people and the, uh, and the heavenly father. But notice verse three, isn't that interesting? Verse three, works involved with that. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That, ma that blends so well with Revelation 14, faith of Jesus Christ and commandments. So here's the thing is that those who are doing good works in the tribulation, those Jews, they have to hold out the best that they can and anything that they're fearful or uncertain about, they can bet it upon their faithful high priest, Jesus Christ. See that? So as long as they're working the best way that they can, they can put their trust in their faithful high priest to be merciful and faithful to them throughout that whole time. All right, do we understand so far? Mm -hmm. All right, we understand so far. Uh, now, God's going to have to supply them and help them during their tribulation, right? They during their overcoming. So he has to help them in, the, uh, in the, uh, the hours of temptation. He has to succor them. He has to provide for them, help them. And he will. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Revelation 3, 10. <coughs> okay, this is tribulation doctrine, right? Revelation. Mm -hmm. And notice right here what he says to them. He's succoring them or providing and helping them during the hours of temptation. Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. See that? They're keeping his word, right? Like 1 John mentioned, keeping commandments. Revelation 14, keeping commandments, right? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. See that? So he's going to sustain them <clears throat> uh, during uh, their times of temptation. Okay, now... If we go to Hebrews 2 again, it would be easier again, and it's pretty more obvious to us that Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 would be more fitting for Christians because this is strongly Pauline, isn't that? Yeah. Who knows this doctrine? Christians. Christians know Jesus Christ is the high priest that mediate for us. He makes intercession for us. And when we're going through temptation, he will provide a way to escape. He will help us during times of temptation. So <clears throat> let's uh, look at, uh, there are three passages I want you to look at. Go to Romans 8, Romans chapter 8. And if you want to, oh no, nine o'clock. All right. Within the 60 seconds, at least look at this board, okay? <laughs> and then we'll call. 
I didn't even get through this. Oh my goodness. All right. Am I in the middle or no? Uh, it's, yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> okay, it's good. All right. <laughs> I think I'll have to keep this, huh? You guys want to write this down? All right. This is all the verses in Hebrews. Notice that? And all of these uh, words are Pauline doctrine. Yeah. See that? These are all Pauline doctrine. The green ones are verse references for Pauline doctrine. So God's faithfulness in temptation plus his priesthood to make intercession. All right. I will cover that next Hebrews class. All right. That, this is going to be really, really good. This was going to be good for you Christians, okay? You're going to get a blessing out of this one. I can't wait to comment the Christian doctrine here. We'll cover it in our next Hebrew study. Hope you had fun, all right? I had, that was a lot of fun tonight, wasn't it? All right. <clears throat> Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us to be rightly dividing the word. Help us to make proper application, to learn everything correctly, what your word intended, and to spiritually grow in knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.